Where'd you grow up? Well, my dad was in the Navy, so I can count almost any place except Chicago. Right. Uh, have it call that my hometown, but mostly uh, in, in uh, Newport News, Annapolis, uh, then during the war in San Diego, California. Yeah. Where'd you take your first airplane ride? Well, my dad, after the war, uh, wanted to go back to his hometown in Texas and raise cattle. Bad idea. But anyway, we had to commute from his hometown to where his brother had purchased this drugstore, which he'd conned my dad to using his cattle money to buy a drugstore. Right. Bad choice. And one day we were driving through the pastures, about a 20-mile drive, and going to school. And there was a barnstormer out there in the pasture uh, with this uh, biplane. And, uh, and it was rides, $5.00. And my dad said, uh, well, would you like to do that? And we were running a little ahead of schedule. So he pulled over and climbed. we climbed through the fence. And I'm laughing because, uh, sorry, the cat has now decided to join us. <laughs> so uh, we uh, we climbed through the fence and uh, strapped me in. And, uh, and I was in the front cockpit and the pilot was in the back. And uh, we took off, uh, bounced along over the over the cattle field and uh, uh, he said would you like to do a loop so we did a loop and it, I thought boy that's kind of low you know but I wasn't even a pilot and uh, so we did a loop and then uh, either maybe one or two and uh, got out and went to school on the way home guess what was implanted in the middle of, of the cattle field the airplane buried into about its nose, and he managed to do a loop with the next rider and uh, killed them both. So that was my first airplane ride. <laughs> <laughs> were you smitten once you were in the airplane? No, I wasn't smitten at that time. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, my dad uh, was what they call Black Shoe Navy, the, the uh, surface Navy. And uh, so I had uh, thought, well, I'll be going to the Naval Academy and become a destroyer. Uh, skipper like he was or something like that mm -hmm. and uh, but in the meantime uh, one summer cruise to take the midshipmen on I was on an aircraft carrier mm -hmm. and it was an old open deck straight uh, deck carrier about as old as they get yeah and they put on a marine reserve air wing that was really out of training and they kill more guys push more f airplanes over the side and at that day and age, uh, there was no Air Force Academy. Right. So all the midshipmen and the people at West Point could elect to get commissioned directly in the Air Force. So towards the end of this cruise, it got caught in a hurricane and it bent the deck up. And I'm thinking, you know, Kurt LeMay, the old, uh, the old strategic air command uh, general, putting out 10,000 feet concrete run raise, that sure looks like it beat this carrier. So I, <laughs> I, I elected to go in the Air Force. And it right. wasn't until I got in the Air Force and uh, flew a little airplane uh, called a T-34, mm -hmm. of which I have uh, one now, uh, that I got smitten with aviation and uh, realized I really liked it. And right, right. And I have a sense you were good at it. Well, I'm, you know, I'm probably the world's best fighter pilot, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> So you join the Air Force, you get commissioned, you learn how to fly. What kind of stuff were you doing? Well, I went to pilot training, of course, was the first uh, phase, and uh, I went into all-weather interceptors, the, uh, the airplanes that were stationed all along the north uh, borders and in uh, Greenland and Iceland and Alaska, because this was the height of the Cold War, 1955. Well, I graduated in '57. And uh, so I was flying interceptors uh, and, and stationed just north of San Francisco, uh, flying F-89 Scorpions, mm -hmm. one version of which uh, was uh, carrying two nuclear weapons, one on each wing. So here, you know, a uh, uh, first lieutenant, you know, with a uh, guy in the back seat, radar operator, uh, he had a switch, I had a switch and a trigger, and that was all it would take to fire that nuke. And uh, yet, uh, nobody ever fired one in, in by mistake, and so that was my first uh, uh, few years before I went to graduate school. 
I was chasing Russians over Iceland, over the North Sea, and uh, and uh, over Canada and elsewhere. Wow, that's serious business. Yeah, it was. Yeah. When did NASA come on your in your in your view? Well, I was uh, stationed, went overseas, came back, and uh, was flying uh, now a, a more advanced interceptor, the F-89, uh, from the F-89 Scorpion. I was flying the F-101 Voodoo, supersonic, beautiful airplane, except it had a nasty little habit. If you got it going too slow, it would flip over, and it would take 15,000 feet to recover it. So uh, anyway, um, I decided I'd want to go to test pilot school. And uh, I went down and saw uh, Colonel Yeager, Chuck Yeager, and uh, they were going through a, a transition because now Sputnik was starting to fly and that kind of thing. And he said, well, what you really need to do is go off and get a graduate degree. And uh, so I'm thinking, I didn't even think. You'll hear Chuck Yeager didn't have, a, I didn't have a college degree telling me to go to college. So I put, applied and uh, was accepted by the Air Force uh, education system and put in nuclear engineering. And I thought, I don't want to be in nuclear engineering. I want to be in astronautical or, uh, or uh, aeronautical engineering. I didn't know at the time that I was one of the probably 10 or 15 that would have been earmarked to possibly be uh, pilots of the nuclear-powered airplane. Can you imagine a worse idea? The, U, the Air Force, everybody had to have, every service had to have its own uh, nuclear device. And of course, the Admiral Rickover and the Navy, with their submarines and then larger ships, uh, that was a successful program. The uh, Army had to have uh, a nuclear power, so they built a reactor on a sledge and had one under the ice in Greenland. They had one down in, uh, in Antarctica. And uh, they had one right outside of Washington, D.C. at Fort Belvoir, down near uh, uh, Mount Vernon, with un no shielding, you know, and so everybody was kind of going happily along. Well, I graduated from uh, graduate school after two years uh, as a nuclear engineer, went back out to see uh, Colonel Yeager again, and uh, he said, well, we've changed our plan. He said, uh, but uh, go ahead and apply anyway. But I had to, I couldn't get in right away. Yeah. So I elected to become a, a, a expert in uh, radiation shielding, space radiation shielding. Right, right. I didn't want to get into weapon development. I could see that was a, not a long-term career. And uh, so um, I was there a little over a year. Uh, and the application to get into NASA had generally been up through Mercury and Gemini that you had to be a graduate test pilot mm. and had to have so many hours. Well, I was driving home one Friday afternoon in my Volkswagen microbus, and uh, listen, I always listened to a, uh, a radio program. It wasn't Fox News or anything like it was just uh, music with a... Uh, Western music with uh, every five minutes they'd have a little news thing. And uh, out of the corner of my ear, I heard the, the announcer saying, he said, well, if anybody, uh, NASA's put out a new uh, application for astronauts. And I thought, well, you know, it's interesting, but I'm not a test pilot. And I heard him say, well, you had to be uh, either, either a test pilot or have a master's degree in some engineering field. So I thought, did I hear him right? So I literally pulled over, waited 15 minutes, wrote down the address to where I'd send an application, mm. and uh, got home. Valerie uh, mentioned, um, I discussed it with Valerie. She's always been supportive uh, of whatever wild hair I had. And uh, so she got out the carbon paper, and we typed up a letter about world's greatest pilot and expert in space radiation, blah, blah, blah. Wait a minute. That's what you said on the letter. Literally, you know. I mean, uh, in a little more, a little more, uh, less grandiose terms. But uh, you know, that's you, when you read it, you think this guy thinks he's the world's greatest pilot and expert in space radiation. 
Well, apparently it was the expert in space radiation, which you know probably was more uh, higher up that totem pole than I was up the world's greatest pilot, because every every fighter pilot thinks he's the best, particularly if they're really short. I mean, the shorter they get, the better they are, you know. And, <laughs> So, <laughs> and NASA, of course, had a height requirement. You had to be under six feet. Yeah, I had to be under six feet in those days, but uh, and I've never had that trouble. But uh, anyway, we sent this uh, registered mail in on a Saturday. Yeah. Well, I get to work at my job at at, at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. And my boss, who was a pilot but also a nuclear engineer, uh, said, oh, by the way, we had a Monday morning meeting. And uh, got our, our assignments, okay, you solve that, you make this bomb, you do this radiation shielding or that kind of thing. And um, he said, oh, by the way, for you pilots, uh, if you're interested in going to NASA, here's a form to fill out. And I thought, form? Who? So I went to the boss, and I said, hey, boss, he and I were pretty good friends, and um, I said, you know about this form. So I told him about I'd sent the application, and he said, oh, just don't worry about it. Put the form in. You know, fill it out. So again, world's greatest pilot, you know, but now it was an official Air Force form. All right. To my surprise, I was called down to, uh, to San Antonio Brooks, Brooks Medical Center for some tests. And I thought, well, this is a joke, you know. They had like, they'd screened it from 5,000 down to like 128 or something like that. And I thought, well, this won't last long. And and, uh, so I went back, and uh, about two months later, I got a call, come back. Now, further tests. I thought, wow. So now the tests were getting more rigorous. And so uh, back in in the spring or the summer of 63, Another set of tests, but now we're down to 28 people. Wow. And uh, the practice had been to to get uh, 100 and cut them to 50 and then 25 and like 12 uh, and mercury was 7. But um, I'm thinking this is pretty serious. Well, on my birthday in 1963, I got a call from Deke Slayton, who was the head of the astronaut office. And he said, how would you like to come and work for us? And I said, oh, that'd be great. I'll be there. The next day, I get a call from Chuck Yeager, getting back around to uh, Colonel Chuck Yeager. He said, well, Bill, he he said, uh, I'm sorry. He said, you didn't make it, uh, but try again next year. Then I made the first of a series of mistakes. I said, (laughs) well, uh, Colonel, uh, I got a better offer. Well, Jaeger hated the astronaut, the NASA astronauts, because the NASA astronauts, still today, as soon as they get named, they become heroes. Right. Haven't done anything, but they're heroes, mm-hmm. okay? Whereas the test pilots out of Edwards had to work for it, you know. Yeah. And he said, what do you mean? He said, uh, you are going to NASA. That can't be. He said, I was on the Air Force screening board, and everybody, every form that came through, this is the Monday morning form, uh, every form that came through, I was on the screening board, and I threw out everybody who wasn't a test pilot. Wow. Then I made the next mistake. I said, well, sir, I guess it must have been that letter I wrote NASA. He went nuts and uh, said he was going to get me thrown out, you know, and I was really getting worried. I mean, just, I'm just a captain, you know, and he's a colonel. I later retired as a brig- uh, major general and when he was a, 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 ten- a brigadier general, and I managed to... <laughs> Get him a couple of times, but that's a different story. But anyway, um, uh, so I called uh, uh, Deke Slayton, and I told him what was going on. Now, I didn't really realize the bad blood right. between NASA astronauts and the Edwards test pilots. Wow. The fact that Jaeger wanted to get me thrown out locked me in to NASA. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's how I got to NASA. Right. Because there was that whole thing, test pilot versus... Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if you read the book, uh, The Right Stuff, For by sure. Tom Wolfe. Uh, the book was great. They made the mistake of getting Jaeger as the movie advisor. And so he t- totally turned the movie around and right. made the astronauts look like a bunch of jerks, yeah. which they kind of were when I mean, you get right down to it. So you end up getting... They said, come join us. Mm-hmm. Deke Slayton says... 
hey, come join our, our group. These are astronauts. At that time in American life, Every kid my age knew the names of every single guy that was going to go to space. Well, I knew the names of the first two groups myself, yeah. you know, and I was thinking... But you guys were rock stars. Well, that, that's always bothered me because I figured, you know, it's one thing to, to be a, a star, but, you know, not before you've done anything. You know, and I, here I was, a, I was an instructor pilot, a fighter pilot, an engineer at the Air Force Weapons Lab, and I figured, now, suddenly I was all over the newspapers in Albuquerque, and they had parades in my honor. I'm thinking, you know, I haven't really done anything yet. <laughs> but, <coughs> but that was the nature of the beast. Right. So what year is this that you go, that you become an astronaut? Well, I was selected in the end of 63 and told to show up the, in January of 64. Right. So, so Valerie and I ro arrived down in Houston, Texas, in 1964. Wow. With the f five kids in tow. When did you... Uh, so Gemini, where, where are they in the space race at that point? They were had just completed uh, Mercury. Well, no. Yeah, they just completed Mercury. Right. Uh, I had an office in this old Air Force base down there, right next to John Glenn, who was leaving. Right. And he was very nice. The rest, uh, most of the others were a little bit standoffish, particularly for a nerd like a nuclear engineer. I mean, you don't want to get too close to him because you might get radioactive. But uh, so, uh, Gemini was just over, or uh, Mercury, Mercury was, just, was over. just over, and Gemini was just getting underway. Right. When did they say, hey, Bill, we're going to do this thing. We want to go to the moon. Why don't, uh, when, how, let, let's get you on board for this. Well, I, was, I wasn't an astronaut when Kennedy made the announcement uh, down at Rice University about uh, going to the moon, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, that struck me as an uh, interesting uh, program for two reasons. One, I've always been kind of a, uh, a rock collector and uh, was a kid and uh, always liked to see the other side of the mountain. I'd go almost anywhere once. Not some of them, not twice, but at least once. Mm -hmm. And uh, But mainly, I was a coal warrior. I mean, I was chasing Russians around over the North Sea. Uh, looking back on the Cold War, uh, it always amazed me. I mean, I've become quite friendly with the Russian cosmonauts. Uh, and But in those days, it was serious business, you know, and mutual oh. assured destruction. And and so uh, NASA uh, was a good way for me to vent my uh, Cold Warrior training. Sure. Um, listen, I grew up, we had uh, civil defense yeah. drills. Duck and week. cover. Big, big siren on the top of the school. Mm-hmm. Huge thing. Yeah, no messing around. Um, was it, was the being an astronaut, was it competitive? Internally? Yeah. It, it never, we, we all were uh, gentlemen enough to, uh, to not make it too obvious, but we all knew that, you know, if, that there must be some kind of cri uh, selection criteria. So some of us figured, well, if we're in good shape, uh, and so we'd get out and run, and if you could do so many push-ups, and uh, it turned out there basically wasn't any selection criteria. Is it, if you were a test pilot, you were kind of higher up the list. Uh, if you uh, uh, had flown before, you were higher up the list. And so me, nuclear, I was at the bottom of the pile. Mm. And... Uh, and uh, it turned out that every, you look back and that's how people got their flights. Yeah. Do you think there was a key event for you, though, that elevated you? Just waiting around long enough <laughs> is what elevated me. I probably set myself back because I was, I was very interested in NASA's rather extensive geology training. And uh, so I volunteered for a couple of extra geology trips, and that kind of made me a bit of a marked man. Hmm. But, you know, I also was uh, picked uh, as a uh, backup crew with Neil Armstrong uh, for Gemini 11. We backed up Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon. And uh, so I spent, you know, uh, six months 
sleeping in the same motel room with Neil and flying all over the place. Right. And uh, and uh, then when Gemini eleven, when Gemini twelve flew, and uh, they solved the problem of uh, of how to uh, maneuver outside of the spacecraft, uh, Buzz Aldrin did a good job doing that. Uh, they canceled Gemini thirteen, and which Neil and I thought we would go back on. Right. And then they had the fire. And so then Neil and I were kind of put out to fly the lunar landing training vehicle. So I thought, well, I've got it made. Here I'm, you know, Neil wasn't the Neil in those days, uh, but he had flown the X-15, and he was a considered pretty senior guy, experienced guy in the second group of astronauts. So I figured, well, here I am teamed up with Neil. We're both flying the lunar landing training vehicle. Frankly, I thought I could fly it better than he could. And uh, and I flew it one morning, he flew it that afternoon, and uh, it crashed, and he barely made it. Oh, that's uh, well documented. Yeah, in fact, I'm the only only lunar module pilot who ever flew the lunar module training vehicle, because right. the rest of them were basically checklist readers, right. and only the commanders, because they were down to one now, and they right. couldn't afford to lose it. <laughs> so, what, the fire was Apollo 1, right? Yes. Yeah. And they were just, they're sitting on the top. They're buckled in. Yeah. I mean, they we, were not going to lift off or anything. It was no, just when you look back, it gets hard to imagine how they didn't, how NASA management didn't think, you know, here are 100% oxygen, slightly pressurized. Yeah. You know, anything will burn. You can throw an asbestos fire blanket in that, and it'll burn. Yeah. So these guys, I mean, they, one little spark, they didn't have a chance. And uh, NASA, that wasn't one of their proud, uh, proudest moments. On the other hand, the the review after that fire, uh, which was led by, from an astronaut point of view, by Frank Borman, who was the commander on our flight, and he and I are very good friends. Uh, Frank doesn't mince words, and uh, they managed, they fixed the spacecraft. I mean, they really fixed it. And uh, so that's why when I finally selected uh, felt reasonably confident to fly in the thing. Yeah. But you're going to go up on a Saturn rocket, which had an, had had any astronauts been on that on that rocket to go into orbit before? Well, when they finally re when they decided they were going to send Apollo eight, which initially was going to be a roughly Apollo nine, uh, second flight with the lunar module. But our lunar module, the, f the first one was falling behind. So when they decided to make Apollo 8 a lunar flight, uh, by, ta by taking the lunar module away, which doomed my chances of landing on the moon. Right. And, uh, al but also uh, is what got me on my post-NASA career. But that's a different story. Um, we were also, besides being the first to leave Earth orbit, we're going to be the first to ride manned on the, the big Saturn V rocket. So you and Jim Lovell and Frank Borman are going to be on this Saturn V rocket that's never flown a human being before. Trepidation? Well, I mean, uh, uh, Frank, had uh, he specialized in the booster, in the review. I specialized, uh, once I was reassigned uh, on Apollo 8 from, a, from having a lunar module, I had become an expert in the systems of the lunar module, but then suddenly I had to really become an expert in the command module. As it started out, the first of our crew wasn't Jim Lovell. It was uh, Frank Borman, Mike Collins, right. and I. But Mike got pulled off the crew because of a bone spur and ended up on Apollo 11. But uh, So I was basically the, the systems engineer, the command module pilot, Jim Lovell was the sextant tester, mm -hmm. and Frank was the uh, overall commander, but he was the booster expert. Gotcha. So uh, I had a lot of faith in Frank. I figured if Frank was going to fly this thing, I would. And I had by that time uh, also knew that Frank and North American Rockwell had uh, redone the command module, and then I had gone over it much deeper in learning how it worked, every valve switch uh, relay. Uh, and as a matter of fact, had a lot of relays. Those were back before they had uh, digital systems. In fact, the 
spacecraft had less digital capability than my Casio watch. You know, and the whole mission control center had uh, less uh, digital capability than your little uh, computer right there in your knee. My iPad. And uh, so it was a lot of analog slide rules, old-fashioned, you know, math computations. Right. But uh, the crew had uh, trained, our crew. Uh, I knew the ground people uh, had really shaped up since uh, the Apollo 1 fire. And so I felt re reasonably confident uh, about the flight. In fact, I fell asleep during uh, uh, the countdown for liftoff. Seriously? Yeah, I mean, you know, once you decide to do it, uh, you might as well quit worrying about it. Now, having been a fighter pilot... <laughs> I'm <pop> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that, but for the rest of us kind of normal folk who aren't maybe made of the right stuff, that's kind of an amazing thing. Well, I mean, here we were, I did a lot more dangerous stuff chasing Russians over the North Sea than I did in any of the Apollo flight. So I felt like I was uh, pretty lucky yeah. uh, to have this cushy job, and which would I would be, you know, I, uh, I didn't know I was going to take Earthrise. Uh, and uh, by then I realized that my chances of landing on the moon were almost nil unless there was a, an Apollo 26 flight. So you fall asleep during the countdown, but then it becomes time that this thing is actually going to, this candle is going to get lit, so to speak. What was it like in that capsule as you're sitting there like this? Well, it was got kind of boring uh, waiting, and I've, I dozed off a couple of times. There was a, a mother mud dauber wasp trying to build a nest in the window. I kept, I kept thinking, boy, she's going to be in for a surprise. She made a bad choice. <laughs> but uh, the actual liftoff itself was, was uh, kind of an eye-opener to me because we had simulated every possible thing we could think of and other people could think of, of failures and, you know, in our simulators, both in the centrifuges. The one thing we hadn't simulated was the violence of the Saturn at, just after it was released because they had these giant F-1 engines, four of them, uh, rotating around the center one, trying to keep us, you know, pointy end up. Yeah. I felt like the bug on the end of a whip antenna, the old-fashioned antenna, getting just thrashed back and forth. And uh, we couldn't hear. If anything was wrong with uh, the instruments that I was monitoring, I couldn't tell Borman. He wisely took his hand off the abort handle because any good fighter pilot would rather die than screw up. And, uh, and so he didn't want to have his hand thrashed and have this abort there when everything was actually going okay. Right. But I thought I had this vision of the, one of the fins of the rocket bouncing up the, great, uh, the girders on the uh, launch tower. Sure. But it was just this uh, thrashing around and the f reflection of the noise. Wow. But uh, we flew out of that, and it got stabilized. And then... Uh, after two and a half minutes, uh, we went, well, before then we went supersonic, so it got quite quiet. And suddenly, suddenly the first stage cut out, and, this, and it felt like we were being catapulted through the instrument panel. I threw my arms up, everybody did, and it... To protect yourself. Yeah, just yeah. instinctively. And, wow. and uh, then the, when, the, when the second stage cut in, my hand came back, and the, and the wrist ring put a... A nick in my helmet, yeah. and I thought, oh boy, here I get enough trouble being the rookie, and they're going to see. Because they've it. been in space before. Oh yeah, you know, and uh, and uh, but when I went to collect the helmets later, the other two had gashes in them as well. <laughs> <clears throat> we were all rookies on the Saturn V. How psyched were you? With how what? How how excited were you to to be going on? Because okay, so let's go through the list first first space flight to leave Earth's orbit, first space flight to go into the moon's orbit, that is if you do it right, mm -hmm. first one to then get out of lunar orbit, exactly that's the key right. thing. It's easy to get in, it's hard to get out. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in mm -hmm. a second, but, and then to come back literally from outer space. And set the world speed record and hit the atmosphere at, you know, quite a bit faster. Right. But look, you know, we were fighter pilots. Uh, I think we were naturally screened to be sort of uh, unemotional, you know, people. 
and uh, you know you can't sit there and quiver uh, the whole time. That's why I didn't like the movie First Man because they did Neil a disservice by having him quivering most of the time, most of the the movie, and he wasn't that kind of guy in my book. Huh. And uh, so you know we were, you know I think generally uh, I don't know blasé is the right word, but we figured this is a chance to serve the country. Uh, we're luckier in hell to be doing this as opposed to being in Vietnam. I thought I had one chance in three of a successful flight, successful mission. One chance in three of being uh, like uh, uh, Apollo 13, where they survive, but their mission wasn't successful. And then one chance in three of not surviving, which is you know probably about equal to my Vietnam odds. Wow. What a thing to be able to be aware of. So I would... I've considered it, you know, I've done all the worrying, or not worrying, but thinking about it. And, uh, you know, it was, it, the one that really carried the load and suffered through it was uh, the wives. And Valerie was very supportive. Yeah. And did you make a, a recording for Valerie? I did, yeah. What did you say in it? Well, I don't, that's personal. <laughs> Seriously. In fact, we, uh, Didia, our archivist, you know, uh, she she's we found the tapes, and even she hasn't heard it, and I haven't heard it since I made it. But you know, it's to, you know, dad's dad's uh, uh, didn't make it, go get married or something like that. I can't remember what I said. If you don't make it, go get married again. Yeah. Uh, no, do get married. Do get married again. I mean, well, of course, she was really a rich woman. She had a hundred thousand dollars worth of life insurance for five kids. <laughs> 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 If you went down. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, can we talk about some of those details? That whole idea of being the first spacecraft to leave Earth's orbit. What, what would that entail? Well, I must say that uh, uh, when we went to the moon, the, the night before I was out on... Uh, in the parking lot. We, we were supposed to be in quarantine, but Lyndon Johnson brought us all up to the White House for one last hoorah for him uh, when this, what was it, the Spanish flu or something was going around. Mm. Hong Kong flu. Right. My old hometown, Hong Kong. Uh, so we weren't really that much in quarantine. So I was out uh, sitting on the uh, hood of the car with, a, with my uh, school mentor and his brother, who was a Jesuit priest, I was a pretty good Catholic in those days, and uh, I remember looking at the moon, and it was very new, because most of the backside, the dark side, of course, uh, most of the backside was illuminated, because all you could see was this little bit of edge. That blue crescent. Yeah, and so most of the near side was the dark side. It mm -hmm. was only illuminated by earth shine. Yeah which is six times brighter than the moonshine, as a matter of fact. Mm. But I, I must say, every time, even today, if I look up and see that little crescent moon, the hair kind of goes up on the back of my neck a little bit. Because, you know, I knew that uh, it's one thing to be in Earth orbit where you all have to do is point the rocket and slow yourself down, and worst of all, the worst came to worst, you'd land in the jungle, you know, and have to escape the snakes or uh, land in the ocean and have to you know float around in your life raft for a while but it, there was no real rescue uh, once you lit that Saturn V upper stage again and set the world speed record and, uh, and how fast were you going we were going uh, 35,000 feet a second you know seven miles a second so uh, that's here to here to Seattle in what uh, eight seconds wow. and um uh, and then, of course, that's one thing going that way. It's vacuum. But when you're coming back, you get the same velocity falling all the way from the moon. And you're hitting the Earth's atmosphere. It, that's when it really got hot. In right. It, you know. Let me get to that in a second. So you're going up to the moon. You've got to, you've got to uh, hit it just right. Because otherwise, if you don't slow down enough... Well, you explain it to me. Because well, you go up and you want to get in orbit. Well, first of all, you got to you got to just barely. It's like trying to race a train to a railroad track, mm -hmm. and uh, so you pass you 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 have pass in front of this 
body right. that's moving, I think, 160 or 6,000. I don't know. It's I think moving it's 4,000 miles 4, an hour. 4,000 miles an hour. Yeah. And the spacecraft has to go right in front of it, get captured by, not captured, by influenced by lunar gravity, mm -hmm. and then slow down so it can be captured by lunar gravity. Right. And you can be in a, in a lunar orbit. Because if you're not captured, you just get shot. Well, you just get, like Apollo 13, you get a free return trajectory, they call it. And uh, so, first of all, the, uh, the, the, the aiming has to be done. And uh, in the simulation, uh, Frank Borman was, uh, you know, he, was the, he, he worried about the rocket and the flight plan. I didn't worry about that at all. Okay, I'm, but my job, he said, Anders, he said, when they tell us when we're going to lose signal by going behind the moon, because mm. it's vacuum, you, could, you, you only transmit uh, line of sight, he says, write that down because that'll tell you whether the calculations were right. Right. So we were going backwards, all set up for our burn. Uh, they gave us the loss of signal. Uh, uh, time, <clears throat> LOS they call it, and uh, suddenly the radio started crackling, you know, it was broken contact, and uh, so Frank said, well, were they on time, Bill? And I said, uh, yeah, Frank, he said, but those are our friends down there. You know, they'll pull the plug even if they're wrong. <laughs> if they're wrong. I said, you <laughs> you <know>? <laughs> <laughs> But as it turns out, they were off by what? They weren't off at all. I mean, they were they were right on. Right. Yeah, it's amazing how they calculated that. And uh, so then we were in the the shadow of the of the Earth back uh, Earth shine. Mm -hmm. So then we were going backwards. We were in the shadow of the Earth shine, and the shadow of sunshine and the moon. We were at what is we technically call the double umbra, the double shadow. And I remember looking, and you, uh, suddenly it was just stars. That you couldn't believe it. If you went to a planetarium, you, 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 know, you couldn't. It was like they turned every star in their, in their planetarium up full blast because you, you, you lost track of, of, uh, of uh, constellations because normally they get screened through the atmosphere. Right. Only the brightest, you know, get, make it to your eyes. Well, you looked up there, and every star, even the tiniest ones, suddenly were brighter. And then I looked back, and here was this big black hole. And that boy, the hair came up on my neck then, and that was the moon. That was just total shadow, absolute blackness. So you were in basically a blackout because of the shadow from the moon and the shadow from the earth. Right. All you see is stars. Yeah, well, you see stars over here, but you don't see stars in that hole. So um, that, that got your attention. That got my attention. You know, I mean, that that kind of got through the old fighter pilot. <laughs> I mean, it's the reptilian brain. It's like, oh shit. You know? <laughs> and, and then you realized it was. Well, I realized it was the moon. You know, and uh, and we were getting, we were all set for our burn to slow down. Mm. And uh, Frank said, "Hey, pay attention." You know, and uh, <laughs> so we started paying attention. Yeah, and. Uh, Suddenly, that looked like oil coming down over the uh, window of the spacecraft, and it, what it was was a refocus my eyes, and it was the uh, lunar sunrise of the mountain tips that were just catching the sun as we went further into uh, uh, lunar sunrise. Right. I mean, that whole <sighs> no one's been there before. Right. Nobody'd seen that before. Is there a part of you that's conscious of this as it's happening to you? Yeah, I'm now being a you know a, a, a being a nerd. I had maybe a little more sensitivity on some of that than the other guys, but uh, uh, you know it was clear to me that uh, here we were seeing lunar surface that nobody had ever seen, and uh, nobody on on Earth ever will unless they go to the moon. Right. Was there pressure? Did you feel pressure as this thing? Because there was an acceleration. I read a story that said the CIA comes to NASA and says, Soviets are going to get the moon before us. we got to get there before they do. do you, are you aware of that story or that scenario? 
We had heard that, and uh, they were trying to figure out, but this is before they made uh, change the mission of Apollo 8. Mm. And one of the, uh, the real leaders of NASA, uh, who was willing to take a risk, NASA today is not willing to take risk at all, to speak of, but uh, a guy by the name of George Lowe, he was uh, born, Austrian-born, uh, Jewish, and escaped uh, to come over here, along with a lot of other great scientists. Uh, anyway, uh, George heard from the CIA, NASA heard, that the Russians were planning this circumlunar flight and had actually already sent unmanned spacecraft around the moon before we did. Wow. Unmanned, unmanned man-capable spacecraft. Right. The first one burned up, came in too fast. The next one, I don't know, and something happened. But that was the story that was circulating. Yeah, and so they could they could launch, and we thought they would. Uh, before us, their launch window was early December. Uh, but uh, Lowe and company went ahead, since we couldn't go anyway because of the our vehicles were behind schedule yet again. You know, NASA looking bad. Uh, they changed the flight and uh, on the hopes that the Russians wouldn't launch. Right. And they didn't. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel pressure? Did you have a sense that there was pressure to get this thing up there? Oh, yeah. Well, again, being a coal warrior, I mean, uh, here was clearly riskier than going into orbit, just into Earth orbit, uh, and uh, riskier than testing, even though we were going to go to an 8,000-mile uh, altitude to test the lunar module, uh, you know, I wanted didn't want them to steal the thunder. Even if they, in retrospect, even if they didn't land or didn't go into lunar orbit, mm. just going around the moon, you know, as a public relations business like you guys are in, uh. Uh, you know, that would have taken away what two thirds of three quarters of the of the uh, the PR. Right. Just and so you know, the people in Bangladesh aren't going to really care whether you're in lunar orbit or not even though it's much harder to, to add that on. Yeah. No. Because so, I think people, I think it's especially difficult at not growing up in this time. Mm-hmm. What if, what in a not, it, it, was, it really was a propaganda race. Oh, yeah. Right? So if the Russians get around the moon first. It, it, unless you understand the Cold War. Yeah. Which is... You know, in retrospect, kind of hard to understand anyway, because both both countries were sticking sharp sticks at each other. Uh, but the seriousness of the Cold War, you know, continuous alert to submarines, even a bit today, unless you understand the Cold War, then it's hard to understand Apollo. Apollo was not a program of exploration. It was not designed to invent Velcro, you know, and all the stuff that NASA claims they invented, most of which they didn't. Okay, uh, it was to beat the Russians because they were making us look sick. The missile gap, you know, uh, Sputnik, Gagarin, uh, and, and Yuri Gagarin was the first astronaut, yeah. cosmonaut to go to space. Yeah, and the do- and even dogs before you yeah. know we had monkeys up there. Yeah. So there was a, quite a competition, and uh, so as a coal warrior, I was definitely hoping you know that we that they wouldn't be able to pull this little trick of going before us. Yeah. So therefore was willing to be, you know, absorb a little more risk. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me what the Earth looked like? Because no one had ever been out of orbit before, and you guys are leaving Earth's orbit, heading toward the moon, but you're facing back toward the Earth again, right? When we launched, after about 25 hours mm-hmm. of climbing up uh, away from the Earth towards the Moon, uh, I started taking pictures. We we separated from the Saturn. We were able to turn around and get a view of the Earth. Yeah. Uh, you could almost see it retreating. It's like a kid look watching this clock in the school. You know, yeah. the, the 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 hand. You can then you look away and it's moved a little bit. Right. So I took a picture of the full Earth, the first full Earth man color shot, which is my favorite picture. And it showed immediately, you know, that the Earth was uh, very uh, pretty, very delicate. It was nothing but blackness around it. You couldn't see stars because of the particles that went around along with the spacecraft would reflect light. 
but it sure showed that the Earth was a very beautiful but quite fragile place. My favorite picture, even though I'm known for the Earthrise picture, yeah. uh, this one is my favorite. And, uh, and particularly as we got further out, where the Earth is about the size of your fist at arm's length, well, you don't have to be a real mathematician to realize that if it's, a, if it's one lunar distance the size of your fist at arm's length, if you're two lunar distance, it's half the size of your fist. Ten lunar distances, it's like that. And, and hundred lunar distance, it's a, you know, a pellet you can, can't even see. And a hundred lunar distances are nowhere in space. So when I'm thinking about or hearing about people talking about, you know, uh, get your ass to Mars or Elon Musk going to take half the population of it, again, that's baloney. You know, they don't have any concept of how far it is. And, uh, and being a radiation expert, they, they, have, they, they really don't have any concept of how bad they're going to get beat up by cosmic rays. I was going to say you need some real serious sunblock. Yeah, and plus the fact that it, it, it kind of disappointing to me when I think it's too bad we can't get the whole United Nations up there to look back and see this planet that they live on, and we all squabble, you know, about who owns what. It's kind of like, you know, uh, ants floating down the Mississippi on a log. Who owns the log? You know, who's the boss of the log? Which ant? And uh, and here, you know, we're still, and it's gotten worse since Apollo. I mean, now we got people who don't mind blowing themselves up. So it's uh, really too bad. Yeah. All right, let's get back into space. So you make the fire right. You do what? Three <laughs> orbits of the moon. Yeah, we go. We're we're going backwards. Right. Head down. Yeah. Going around the moon. Yeah. Slowed us down. Got captured. Uh, and did three orbits. Right. I listened to the recording of the voices of you guys as you come out of this third mm -hmm. orbit and you realize, oh my gosh, you can see the Earth. You guys sounded like you were pretty pumped up. Well, it came as a big surprise because we'd had no training uh, on, on taking a picture of the, of the Earth. We were supposed to be taking pictures of the lunar surface. So <clears throat> I grabbed a camera, pointed it at the Earth, and... Uh, put a long lens on the camera uh, after the first couple of shots and got color film and started clicking away by changing the f-stop. Frank Borman in the process jokingly said, oh, you can't do that, Andrews. It's not on the flight plan. Because <laughs> nowhere in NASA's schedule was it, oh, take pictures of the Earth while you're up. Exactly, right. And uh, I think the NASA photographers got a little bit in trouble about that. And they've sort of, they've come up with a slightly different story, but it's, uh, mine is true. <laughs> But it is interesting because the focus is so much on the moon. Right. No one thought, oh, you're going to look, you'll be able to look at the Earth in a way no one's seen it before. Right. And you should have said, okay, now in your third orbit, when the Earth comes up, make sure you have F-16 and, yeah. uh, and point it, you know. And, but it, uh, it was just spontaneous. When you think about it now, when you put yourself back in that spacecraft... <coughs> And all of a sudden, that sight comes up on the horizon. What do you think? Well, I was impressed uh, because uh, here, you know, a hard, hard-nosed fighter pilot uh, seeing this beautiful Earth, which we'd seen, you know, in the whole Earth earlier, but we hadn't seen it against the stark lunar surface. It took about three orbits to f for the moon to get boring. I mean, it was just like it. Uh, it, it was just shell-shocked. It looked like Verdun, you know, nothing but holes. Uh, you know, one hole, the closer you looked, the more holes there were. Just a big old rock. It's just a big pounded up rock. And uh, so when the Earth came up uh, over the lunar horizon, that's when it really impressed me as to how much more delicate the Earth was and colorful. The moon was not colorful. And uh, that sort of changed my outlook on, uh, you know, the whole issue of, uh, of environmentalism and whatnot. Really? Yeah. For how? Talk about that. Well, I mean, I, you know, I was, uh, you know, a typical uh, engineer, 
you know, we weren't uh, worried about too much about the earth. And uh, since then, of course, it's become might even have overshot, but at least uh, people are now. Rachel Carlson was struggling, you know, trying to get uh, Silent Spring and all of that uh, going. So I think the the, uh, the Earthrise picture, though I wouldn't take credit with uh, starting the environmental movement. I think it did help kickstart it along, and has become uh, <clears throat> increasingly iconic as the time has gone by. The um <clears throat> well, let's get back to Earth, and then I'll ask you some more questions because the per picture ends up being published. Um, so you make your orbits of the of the of the moon, and then it's time to go home. At what point? At what day of the year is that? Then this is uh, somewhat slightly before Christmas, right. I recollect. So it's Christmas Eve, and you're up there. 240,000 miles from Earth. I don't remember whether we were in Earth orbit or lunar orbit at Christmas Eve or, or if not. you're yeah. heading back. Pardon me? Or or were you heading back? I don't remember. Okay. I'm um, 85, man. I'm getting to be old. You know? I mean, did I go to the moon? We... <laughs> <laughs> Was that you? Are we talking to the right guy? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are up there. It's Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do a, a broadcast, right? Back to Earth. Did they tell you? Well, you should say something, or you should read something on on Christmas Eve. What did they give you any instruction? Well, apparently, uh, before the flight, NASA hierarchy uh, told Frank that basically we were going to be up there during Christmas Eve, and uh, it, they ought to have a message. Uh, and it ought not to be silly. And so... Uh, not we saw Santa Claus across. Yeah, yeah, so it, we don't sing Jingle Bells, but, but uh, hardly any instruction. About as much instruction as we have how to take a picture of the Earthrise. So Frank went to the, I think, the U.S. Information Agency, a friend of his, uh, who, a guy by the name of Cy Borgine, who uh, uh, talked to... Um, a friend of his, uh, and he and his, this friend, the second friend, was talking to it with his wife, and she said, well, why don't they just read from Genesis? Mm. And so that was it. Frank decided it was a good idea. Never told NASA. They didn't have any idea what we were going to do, mm. which in retrospect strikes me as a little bit loose. And uh, because some of the astronauts were much less serious than Frank was, is. And uh, so uh, we each had a little piece of paper, reading from the first few verses of uh, Genesis from the King James Version of the Bible. Right. And Frank, Frank said the biggest success of Apollo 8 was getting An Anders, then the good Catholic, to read from the King James Version of the Bible. Frank was Episcopalian. <laughs> Both of us have changed. <laughs> That's pretty good. Do you remember what part you read? I read the first part. Right. Uh, though I, oh, for quite a while, Borman was credit, credited with reading the first and the last because his voice and mine sound so much alike. Uh -huh. But I started it off, and uh, Jim Lovell filled in the middle, the firmament and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, then Frank ended up uh, with the last and then uh, said, you know, and uh, good night and Merry Christmas, everybody on the good earth. On the good earth. And apparently that really shocked the people. The whole thing shocked them at Mission Control. They uh, they weren't expecting that whatsoever. Huh. I, in, and as I was reading this and then listening to it today, the other thing that really threw me was there was no God bless the USA. There was no there was no rah rah in that. Yeah. It was just this is a message we want to send to. Whoever, whoever may be listening, wherever they may be. I, I thought, and I think the crew did, thought that Apollo was not just a demonstration to the U.S. Uh, that capitalism was better than communism and, or socialism and uh, that uh, free enterprise was the way to go, but also a message to the rest of the world uh, that uh, the United States was not a loser country as it was appearing to be. Uh, when John F. Kennedy started it off. 
But there was no, there was no cheering. There was no, look what we did here. Well, well, there was a lot of cheering when we after we splashed down in the sure. uh, in the ocean. But yeah. uh, fact, I think the most jingoistic said thing said was after we landed, uh, the helicopter pilot said, "Well, is the moon made of green cheese?" And I said, "No, it's made out of American cheese." <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're heading heading uh, you're heading back. You you're going at a phenomenal rate of speed. How hard was it? I mean, no one's ever done this before. No one's ever re-entered the uh, at, uh, Earth's atmosphere, having been all the way out of Earth's orbit. No one's done it. Right. Well, they've driven, they drove us a, a command module back down at high velocity, unmanned. Right. But we were the first manned flight, and uh, and so uh, we were worried, of course, how the heat shield would hold up. And during the reentry, which was at night. Uh, we, were not, you know, we came in to make it even more complicated all the way at night, all the way from the moon coming in at night. We couldn't see the chutes, but we could see, the, of course, the fire coming around the spacecraft during entry itself. And what worried me was there was looked like chunks coming off the, spa the heat shield. Well, they were really just tiny ionized parts of the heat shield, which would flare up. And I could almost feel the heat coming in my back which of course was my imagination. But, really? But then uh, when, the, we, when, it, when we got through blackout and uh, the parachutes fired, we couldn't see how many there were. If there were two, it would be a hard hit. If it was one, we probably wouldn't survive. Turned out there were three. Right. And uh, still sounded like it was a pretty hard hit. Yeah, it was, well we hit coming up and it knocked Frank's uh, hand off the uh, parachute release handle switch. <clears throat> and we got flipped upside down. So here we are, you know, like travelers in a New York subway that just got turned over and all the trash was falling in our faces. And, right. and, and uh, But we we got it turned over and uh, poor Frank got sick again. But uh, right. And then Lovell and I were merciless because we were both <laughs> West Point graduates. Or he was, we were both Naval Academy graduates. He was West Point. Well, and you clearly were superior. Yeah, right. At least at that moment. So you guys are, are lifting off. You're leaving Earth's uh, gravitational pull. And Borman gets sick? Yeah. What happened? Well, uh, <clears throat> Is this a sensitive subject? No, not really. He's sort of... I mean, it... it, it uh, you know, Frank's a fighter pilot, and uh, so he's been twisted around a lot in... Uh, but he took a sleeping pill because mm -hmm. uh, he was worried about getting to sleep. But also he had the load of command on him, right? Okay, which is more intense. I mean, all we had to do, I mean, I, I could screw up the switches and would be embarrassed, but uh, he's the command of the whole thing. Sure. So uh, <coughs> he went down to try to sleep, and Lovell and I were up in the... Uh, uh, in the <clears throat> on the couches, he was down in what we call the equipment bay, and uh, had to have, wanted to have a, a bowel movement, I guess. And the next thing you know, he's had a throwing up and had diarrhea all at once. It was really a mess, and uh, that was not a pleasant experience. I grabbed an oxygen mask and slapped it on. Lovell said, "Oh, you're not supposed to use it." I said, "To hell with that!" And, you know, I put the. You know, <laughs> And uh, it was for fire, uh, but uh, I remember uh, out of the equipment bay came this sort of glob about the size of a, of a handball, multicolored glob of vomitus that had uh, congealed somehow together, you know, just surface tension like water would and right. does. But it was, and I looked at it, and it was oscillating. And, I, and I, the physicist in me said, man, that's interesting. You know, and I'm watching this thing, and Lovell's over here, and this is coming. And it gets about here, and it splits. Parts of it go this way, but the laws of conservation had the other one then turn. And I'm watching Lovell watch it come, and it splatted on his chest like a green fried egg. <laughs> but we, uh, we had to clean the spacecraft up, and... Uh, it's amazing how you get used to filth. Right. I mean, you know, after a while, you know, just using the facilities, you just 
okay, what's for dinner? Because the other part of this is once you guys splash down, what do we used to call them, Navy frogmen? Mm -hmm. The guys come, you know, you land fairly close to the carrier, helicopters come off, guys come splash in the water and come to pop the lid off the off the space capsule, right? Yeah, and there was this one uh, Navy SEAL, turned out he was a Marine, Corporal. Uh, he would look in the window every now and then and go like, well, they, first of all, they didn't land, for they didn't jump in because there were sharks. But uh, when they did come in, they started inflating this collar, so they to, to, to damp Stabilize it. the craft, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, uh, Young man would look in, and I'd give him the mm -hmm. view of my my window, and and because uh, my only window was most of the others were pretty much fogged up. They were right. So when we finally level cranked the hatch open, and the guy put his head in, then he fell back, and we all got out, and got up, and then we got back on the carrier after uh, talking to the president, got cleaned up. Went down and here were these the frogmen, about five of them all lined up with the uniform on, and I recognized this guy, and I said, "Well, uh, Corporal," I said, uh, uh, "I saw you kind of fell back." I said, uh, "Was it the way we looked?" He said, "No, sir. It was the way you smelled." <laughs> <laughs> so the you guys get back to the mainland. The picture is finally published of Earth rising. Had you any anticipation of what the reaction might be? Well, I'd sort of forgotten about Earthrise, and uh, I did get a call early on the night the film was developed. They said, you got to get down here. Looks like we found grass on the moon. I mean, you know, like not lawn grass, not, right. not grass. But um, because there was a green tinge, and they had mixed the, the, some of the developing fluid improperly. <laughs> so they got the green tinge out. And um, it was several days later when NASA, as far as I know, or maybe weeks later, I don't, can't remember, picked one of the many Earthrise pictures that were taken. Yeah. Uh, picked one with the long lens and the color film that happened to be the one I took and made a... You're going to make a stamp out of it, a oh. commemorative stamp. Right. And it was then that I got to, well, maybe this is kind of uh, important. Now, at this stage of the game, everybody was claiming they took the picture. Uh, we knew Lovell didn't, both Borman and I. But Borman actually thought he did. Hmm. And uh, he took a black and white. He didn't have, a, nor did he have a 250-millimeter lens on it. Right. Uh, but uh, he eventually uh, uh, was convinced that he didn't take it. Right. But uh, it was it was then that it, uh, it it started sinking in that this was a uh, you know a pretty picture. Yeah. Uh, but it was years before it became, in my view, uh, iconic. Time, life, look, photography magazine. I think they're all out of business now, but. Uh, they all chose the top, had picked the top 10 pictures of the year, mm -hmm. and the Earthrise was one of the leads for every one of those magazines and appeared on the cover of two of them, I believe. So that's when uh, Earthrise, I think, became officially iconic. Right. The Time magazine was men of the year. Right. Uh, that was the three of us on, on the crew. Which is a good transition. I'll, I'll get to what I really want to talk about, which is there's, a, there's an argument now, or at least a discussion, that maybe your flight, maybe Apollo 8 was the one that was really important to be able to go, to be able to get in Moon's orbit, to be able to go in it and then get out of it. Because unless you can do that, unless you show that it can be done, there is no, there is no moonwalk. Well, that's true. I mean, all the flights leading up to Apollo 11 had to be successful. Apollo 7, we wouldn't have gone. Apollo uh, 8, of course, did what you just described. Apollo 9 tested the, uh, the lunar module. Apollo 10 went up to the moon. So <clears throat> you might say uh, that my good friend Neil Armstrong, all he did was just land on the moon. 
I would switch with him today. I'd, I'd rather have that less important flight than having taken the, the uh, Earthrise picture, frankly. Really? Yeah. But on the other hand, looking back, uh, you could argue that 100 years from now, what will they remember? Uh, I don't think they'll remember Apollo 13. You know, I've I mentioned to Jim Lovell, I said, he said, I'm going to be remembered for Apollo 13. I said, Jim, you're going to be remembered for a failure? You know, uh, so he's now become uh, very interested in Apollo 8. But uh, uh, so we did have quite a few first. We just didn't have the first footprint on the moon. And I think that the, the historians 100 years from now will remember, you know, the footprint and this guy Armstrong who did it uh, was the first man. And uh, they won't remember much else about the flight. And they'll remember uh, Apollo 8 and its Earth rise. Yeah. But you guys did what you did. And since then, recently, yeah. uh, the International Astronautical Un Union, who I'd been in a mini war with for ever since 1975 when they ignored some craters that I had named uh, on the moon, uh, picked three craters to name after, to, to relate to our crew, or two craters, one of them being, uh, well, they had done uh, Mount Maryland for Jim Lovell, but they did uh, pick one uh, that they couldn't re have another. I've already got one on the moon, uh, but uh, they couldn't name another one after me, but they wanted to do something nice, so uh, they uh, picked Anders apostrophe Earthrise. In other words, they said, we can do an event, mm. but we can't do another name. Right. So there is a new crater on the moon, which didn't have a name, which now is called Anders Earthrise. I told them that I'd, that was really better deal than what I had wanted and been fighting for, but I wouldn't do it unless Frank Borman got one. Right. And so we called Frank Borman right there from the super secret uh, IAU meeting uh, and, uh, fr and said, Frank, how about we're going to, we want to name a crater related to you. And he, I don't want my name on a crater. <laughs> so, so they did it, uh, uh, eight homeward. Right. Is after Frank. Right. You think of the, about the year 1968, though, and the things that come to mind is the escalation of the Vietnam War. Martin Luther King gets assassinated. Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated. And at the end of the year, you guys go up there and do something that's never been done before. Time magazine was going to put the dissenter as their man of the year, and instead it puts, puts, the, puts the astronauts from Apollo 8 on the cover. That's no small deal. Yeah, that was a surprise to me that that happened. Later, Frank Borman got a letter from some woman out in the middle of Nebraska or somewhere that said, thank you, you saved 1968, and cited the very things you cited. Right. Um, so you're up there. You do read Genesis, which I didn't, you know, messed up. Boy, my mother would be very unhappy with me at this moment. I have a copy of it if you like. Yeah, in a second. Yeah. So on your way down, and as it gets to be Christmas, well, we'd... We have all these recollections of NASA playing various kinds of music, especially when the uh, uh, space shuttles went up for different days and whatever. Did NASA play some Christmas music for you guys? Well, I, they asked for records. Right. And so I gave them several, the old 78, or not 78, 33 and a third right. uh, LPs. LPs, yes. And uh, one of them was uh, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. That's the first music broadcast in space was, uh, was a Tijuana Brass. <laughs> Not a great start. A taste, <coughs> a taste of honey was a big hit. But um, one of the songs that I, one of them was a, uh, by a, a choral group called Norman Luboff Chor Chorale. Yeah. And they played Old Holy Night. On the way back, yeah, and uh, the spacecraft was slowly rotating to maintain the right average temperature, and we had one big powerful antenna that would kind of track the Earth if I turned it, and then we had some just body-mounted weaker antennas, 
And uh, while they were playing this, uh, I was a little late on turning the antenna at the earth, and, the, and it started warbling. Mm. And that raised the hair on the back of my neck, you know, to hear, you know, Oh Holy Night started going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was listening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a serious question. Because I read that, having been raised a Catholic, you were a, 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 a God-fearing Catholic. Did that experience of going into space and seeing the earth the way you saw it, did it change your view of, did it change your belief system? Well, when one looks back at this tiny little physical dust boat that we live on around a rather insignificant planet, around in, a, in what is a, you know, a galaxy out on the left field of the universe, right. it's hard to imagine that uh, things really rotate around the Earth and that, uh, in fact, most religions are very Earth-centric. And yet, it's hard for me to imagine that God has a big supercomputer up there keeping track of everything. And uh, so that kind of undercut my, uh, my uh, Catholicism, where everything rotates around Rome. And, uh, right. So. I got gotcha. you. Um, to do something like as important as you did, to go where you went and to see what you saw, what is the thing that stays with you? Well, I realize uh, how lucky I was to uh, be on that flight. Uh, even though I didn't get to walk on the moon, I clearly uh, made uh, that early part of my life uh, something that might well last uh, through history. So do you remember where you were during Apollo 11 when Neil Armstrong first steps foot on the moon? Well, I was backup crew for Apollo 11, and uh, Jim Lovell and I and, uh, and, my, and uh, Fred Hayes were backup crew for Apollo 11. So I was at Janet Armstrong's house, uh, Neil's house, uh, along with Valerie and uh, the other Your many wife. other astro yeah. astronaut wives, uh, along with my wife Valerie, uh, sitting on her bed explaining the details on uh, on the television. Of course, when they got into this issue about whether the computer was overloaded, I mean, I didn't know what was going on either. But I knew that having flown the lunar landing training vehicle, when they said, "Oh, we're down to." You know, thirty minutes of or thirty seconds of fuel. You know, we all, we'd we'd land and take off again with that low level of fuel. We right. we that wasn't a big deal. Yeah. So I was reassuring her that don't worry, it's got a lot of gas, so uh, he, he'll make it. Because that was that whole thing is that as it been has been dramatized that it was literally running out of fuel as it was. You know, well, it was designed to do that. I mean, you didn't want to carry a lot of extra gas. Yeah. But uh, so they had a, you know, uh, they had, they, he could have made two landings. Huh. But your experience was it, with it, was sufficient for you to be able to tell Neil Armstrong's wife, don't worry, it's good. Right. I, I didn't know how to explain the computer situation, where they'd have to abort for that. Right. But uh, I could also tell her that uh, they had enough fuel where the descent stage wouldn't run out of gas uh, before they could abort with the ascent stage. Yeah. What What was it like in that room when he steps out? Uh, I wasn't there when he stepped out. Uh -huh. he, he didn't step out immediately. We right. sat down there for several hours. Okay. But it was everybody was very pleased when he said, uh, you know, tranquility base here, the eagle has landed, which I thought were perfect words. 